live in, God, that you've created for us. I thank you for your word today, God, that just continues and always will challenge, exhort, and encourage us, God. And I, I just invite you, God, to just blow our minds today, God, with your incredibly powerful and true word, God. And I know that when you do that, we change our lives. Our lives change by, by what you teach us. That's what your word promises. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so we invite you to do that in our lives today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the, uh, the picture I was going to show you guys earlier today, we were talking about uh, the fear of death. You remember that? We were talking about fearing death, right? And uh, I just want to share this brief story with you. But on Saturday, January 13th at about 8, 8, 8 o'clock in the morning, I was cruising in my office preparing Sunday's sermon. My wife was at work. She works for a tour boat company down in Port Allen. And um, my phone goes, <coughs> which... When you live in Hawaii, you're part of the civil defense warning system. We get these about once a year, I'd say, Maddie, something like that. And usually what it means is there's a tsunami warning, like there's been an earthquake in Samoa, or there's a giant storm coming in. I'm pointing that way because that's the way they always come in, and you're under flash flood warning, right? So I'm sitting there studying, looking at my computer. My phone goes, and I turn my phone over, and this is what I see. Can you all read it? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. Emerge in case you can't see. Emergency alert. Ballistic. Now, you know what a ballistic missile is? That's what carries nuclear warheads, right? Threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. Can you see the last line? This is not a drill. Well, that's an interesting way to start your Saturday morning. Right about the time I see this, I'm like, I wonder if this is real. I get a text from Stephanie Rogers, who you know, who happens to work, guess where? At the Pacific Missile Range out on the west side of the island. You know what they do out there? They have a giant satellite system so they can shoot down incoming rockets from North Korea. She ought to kind of know a little bit what's going on, right? She texts me. By the way, we think this is real. Take shelter now. Right then my phone rings. <laughs> it's my wife. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Hi, honey. Did you get the warning? I got the warning. What do you think we ought to do? I don't know. What do you think we can do? I said, hopefully it's going to Oahu. Ooh, that's kind of a terrible thought, isn't it? I hope it's them. But however, because the missile base on the west side here is the very base that will protect us from missiles. Strategically, would it not make sense if they were going to send a missile to take that place out first, right? Which would basically nuke Kauai. So I go, well, I just heard from Stephanie. She thinks this is real. You know what my wife says? Well, good thing I know our kids are saved. I know I'm saved, and I know you're saved. Maybe I'll see you later in heaven. That's <laughs> what she says. I go, sweetie, I love you. You got some serious cojones, which is kind of an awkward statement because she's my wife or whatever. And she goes, okay, well, I think we're going to go get the closet. <laughs> and I go, all right, I love you. I'll either see you in heaven or I'll talk to you in a few minutes. Okay, love you. Bye. That was it. That's all I had to tell you, that story. And then about 20 minutes later, oh, big mistake. Sorry, sorry. It was an accident. Somebody hit the wrong button. Which, um, by the way, trivia question, did he lose his job? Answer, no, not in Hawaii. You can't lose your job if you work for the state, and, like union protected. Anyways, the only reason I like to tell you this story is I love my wife's response. I mean, it could have been a nuclear bomb headed our way, and she goes, well, I know where I'm going. I know where you're going. I know where the kids are going. See you in heaven. I love that. This is my my wife, she's freaking awesome. Okay, so how I'm going to start today, oh, I got to tell you something, guys. So just so you know, I was thinking about this while I was preparing the, the first thing I'm going to do here on the whiteboard today, and I realized virtually every time I talk to you guys, I'm getting you some big giant theory, right? Like these like global philosophical theories, 
And I think it's been like a lot, because it's kind of like one every session. But I want to submit to you right now, today, that what I'm doing is I'm setting up the whole rest of the book of Luke. Does that make sense? Because the whole rest of the book of Luke, we're going to keep coming back to these themes. And, you know, we're going to get, this is kind of cool to think about, Jesus is going to teach us, right? Because when we get to the teachings of Jesus, they're for us. And Jesus is going to hit on every one of these things. So let me give you an example. This morning we talked about people mistaking Jesus for just a military leader, right, who's going to throw off Rome, and he's going to be talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom to come. Does that make sense? So this is going to be a theme that I taught you this morning, but we're going to see that theme all through the book of Luke. So what I'm going to teach you right now is also a theme that you're going to see not only through the book of Luke, but it's all through the rest of your life, and it's called worldview. And I'm going to give you sort of the Christian worldview, but before I do, we're going to do the worldview for pretty much the whole world. And I want to just, uh, I'm going to give you the title of a book, and if you're really interested, I'll buy you the book. I'll order the book, and if you promise, you'll read it, <laughs> okay? Because it's a really good book. I read it only about four or five years ago. It kind of helped me. It opened my mind, and I've kind of been sort of spouting this philosophy ever since. And so if you're interested, it's called Total Truth by Nancy Piercy. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you this super, super short version of a really long, complicated subject. But it goes like this. She describes it as there's an upper room and a lower room. And so there's a line between them. Okay, here's that. So you guys are going to really laugh at my handwriting. <laughs> it's terrible. But here it is. The lower room, all right, and here's the upper. Now, what I mean by that is, down here is what we call the material world. Some people call it reality, but that's an interesting question in the light of what I'm going to show you. So, the material world would be anything that you can actually physically touch and prove its existence because it's right there. So, just for fun, give me an example of one material thing. Anybody? Money. Wait, wait money? <laughs> now, now, if you say money, that's interesting. Because a dollar bill, we could use a dollar bill. So let's see a dollar bill, okay? There's a dollar bill. We all know what that is. We all maybe have one in our pocket. Anybody else? A house. A house. <laughs> I'm just going to draw one. <laughs> There's a house. Uh, you know what I was thinking today? A donut is a real thing, right? You can touch a donut, you can smell a donut, you can eat a donut. Clearly, this is a donut, right? Okay, if I had a donut, I might Now, I'm just being a little facetious, but this is, this is a real thing. This is called the material world. Now, in the upper room exists everything that most of us believe is a real thing and exists, but you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it. You can maybe see what it does. Like, I can give you an example, money is a concept. <laughs> Do you ever think about that? What is it if I give you a dollar, you can go trade that for Snickers? Why is that? Well, apparently, a Snick well, it's like two bucks for a Snickers now, huh? <laughs> right? Well, apparently, two pieces of paper equal one candy bar. Why? Well, there's this concept. Have you ever thought about the fact that we all have, have to agree that a dollar is worth something, and if we don't, it's not worth anything? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Okay, let me, let me give you some better examples. Uh, let's think of some things. How about, like, love? Uh, gravity, that's a good one, but I'm not going to use that. That's a good one, though. I like that. How about, um, here's one of my favorite ones, justice. <laughs> here's another one, truth. Uh, beauty. Uh, and I think I left out one really important one, which is why I made myself even many notes. Oh, this is like, yeah, the most important one. Here's one. Good and evil. The idea that there's right and wrong, good things and bad things and evil things. Now, this is nothing really brand new for you guys or whatever this and that. But here's what I think you might find interesting. <laughs> Everybody, whether they admit it or not, believes in both of these things, right? The reason I say that is, let's go to the extreme. So up the extreme of people who won't say they only believe in the upper would be like Buddhists or other Asian type, Asian philosophy. Now what they say is that all of this is an illusion. None of this is real. Does that make sense? Yeah? Like there's no such thing as reality. We're just, it's a dream or we're imagining it. Okay, good luck with that. 
And then down here you have like say an atheist, but not just an atheist, but what we call an, a materialist. Now these people, <laughs> my writing, whatever, a materialist. Now these people down here, they claim that they don't believe in any of this. Oh, no, no, no. Only what I can prove through science is what's real. The only thing that's real is if I can put it in a test tube and do scientific experiments on it, if I can see it in a microscope, if I can touch it or feel it. Now, this is actually problematic because think about it. This person up here, the Buddhist, he's in a little bit of a problem because what happens if he gets like super hungry? <laughs> what does he need? <laughs> a donut, right? Like, he can't really, like, live his life only in some esoteric, oh, none of this is real, only the spirit world exists, right? Same thing with the materialist down here. He might claim, I, 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 I'm an atheist, I don't believe in any, by the way, another word for up here is transcendent, you know, above us, beyond us. I don't believe in any some phony transcendent reality. These are all human concepts, but the only thing that's real... Well, he runs into trouble when somebody breaks into his car and steals his stereo, and suddenly he wants justice, right? How dare you? Or if you punch him in the face, why would be someone be so mean and evil? You're like, but there is no good, right? All of a sudden, he wants to have good and evil, and he wants justice. So here's the point that Nancy Piercy makes in her book. She says, every human on the planet exists and understands this world, but they have to make the leap into this world. And in here is a gap because we cannot physically prove this, right? But most people, not most people, everybody, everybody actually lives their life according to this because these are the things that bring, and here's a really key word, meaning. Meaning is all up here, and by the way, you want to see something cool? What are the fruits of the Spirit? <laughs> Galatians 5.22. Did you ever notice that everything you just said, everything you just said is all up here, isn't it? Yeah? Love, joy, peace, patience, all that is ideas. It's all esoteric. It's all transcendent ideas. Now, the interesting thing is, what people think will bring them love or peace, they think money, dollar bills, right? If I could only have more money, then I could have more peace. Do you see the connection between material and immaterial? Okay, now with that in mind, I'm going to make a big claim that I'm going to show you in Scripture, and that is what Nancy Piercy said. When she said this, she kind of blew my mind. She goes, look, every religion, and even people that think they're not religious, they have a worldview. Does that make sense? Everybody has a worldview, their own idea of what's right and wrong, and da da da. Even if they claim, I don't believe in God, I'm an atheist, I'm a materialist, they still have ideas about what's right and wrong, right? Everybody on the planet has to make that leap. Now, this is what Nancy Piercy says that I love. She says this Christianity, the Christian religion, is the most holistic worldview that exists on the entire planet. She's compared it to every religion there is on the planet and even every secular philosophy. And she says, in Christianity, has the smallest gap between these two worlds. In fact, if you're truly living out your faith, there is no gap between the material world and the immaterial world. Are you with me? Did that make sense? Okay, a little bit of heavy philosophy for, you know, where are we at? 4.45 on a Friday afternoon when you're probably wondering what the surf's doing, or at least that's what I am. Okay, so with that in mind, I give you <laughs> the birth of Christ, the Christmas story. So I know you all know the Christmas story, but let's look at it with fresh eyes today. So join me in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Uh, let's see, let me put that out of the way. Okay. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cur Curinius, <laughs> whatever that is, Curinius, was, oh, by the way, just so you know, a lot of times when I come up, I come, come up against funny names, I just make up the pronunciation. Do you, know, you know why? Because I used to go to these websites where they say, the correct pronunciation is Jehoshaphat, right? 
Then I found out something really interesting. Nobody really knows. I'm not, I'm not kidding. In ancient Hebrew and even old biblical Greek, it's gone, it's gone on so long that even scholars only speculate how to pronounce those names. When I heard that, I'm like, screw it, I'll pronounce it any way I want. Okay? So Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. Now, um, okay, so Augustus um, was the first... At, oh, you guys see a picture of Augustus? Not really a nice looking guy, huh? He looks kind of angry, doesn't he? He's the first actual Roman emperor who ruled all of Rome unchallenged from 27 BC, that's before Christ, to 14 years after death. Now, why is that important? Because I'm going I'm to show you a little bit more about the conditions. We talked about that a couple days ago that were set up that was part of the gospel. This is now there's like peace in Rome because one guy has squashed all the resistance to his rule, so he's reigning himself, okay? And by the way, he claims that he is divine, or he has divinity. What does that mean? He's God. He claims that he is God. Divine means God. So he has claimed that he's God. So don't miss the irony of what's going to happen under his reign, which is the birth of a baby who's going to be called the King of Kings. And he's thinking he's the God King, all right? And so Luke, who's writing this book, is writing from the Gentile world that is super aware of the ramifications of having a king born in a manger that might be a threat to the king, Caesar, who claims to be God. Now, all this is happening in the context of what is called, and remember, this is the, this is the theory I'm going to give you right here. Pax Romana. You might want to write this down. It sounds like a pasta you might serve with garlic bread, doesn't it? Yeah, I'll have the Pax Romana and extra garlic bread, yeah? Pax, Latin for peace. Romana, Latin for Rome. <laughs> it's the Rome peace. This is a period of time between three and four hundred years when there was Remember all those things I told you? There was a um, universal language, a universal money system. There was no war going on. I mean, at least no major wars. There was a mail system. There was um, safety, and there was travel and universal communication going all the way from the, the north tip of Scotland all the way down to Alexandria, up to the churches of Galatia, and as Far east is Iraq. Are you with me? This is all together called the Pax Romana. That was a total historical anomaly. It had never happened in the history of the world, and it sets up the arrival of... Okay, let's talk about that. Verses 4 to 7. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. And everybody just go, aww. It's like the cute Christmas party. Everybody knows what's going on. Okay. First of all, um, wait, they're still betrothed? They're not married yet? Yes. <laughs> well, Scripture says a couple different things, but whether they were fully married or about to be married, we don't really know. But, um, you know, it's also interesting, it doesn't say how long they're there. We always kind of picture, what, one night? Like, for all we know, they might have been there a few months. Isn't that interesting? Like, Jesus might have spent his first months there. Anybody here been to Bethlehem? Oh, you guys haven't been to Israel yet, yeah. Okay, that's a time for another story for another time. Okay, um, but here is... The great significance. You've heard the Christmas story your entire life, right? What I want you to catch right now is the significance of what just happened here. This is not just a story about a cute little baby born in a manger because there was no room at the inn, okay? Because here's why. In about 33 years, that little baby is going to make his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and they're going to be hailing him as a king, all right? 
The day he's resurrected from the grave after they put him to death, he's going to be like, ba-boom, it's me, I'm back. But look what is happening right here. And this is what's happening right in front of our eyes in this story, and that's this. You guys have heard this your whole lives, right? You're super familiar with this verse. The word became flesh, and it made his dwelling among us. Now, before I tell you exactly what that word dwelling is, what I want to submit to you is I want to go back to this example. And what I want to show you what makes the birth of Christ so amazing is we all believe in a transcendent, right? Invisible, spiritual God, right? You with me? And 2,000 years ago, according to what we just read in the Bible, that spiritual God entered into the material world. Does that make sense? Now, there's no other theory or religion on the planet where this happens. And so this is why I believe Nancy Piercy when she says it's the most holistic religion on the face of the planet because only Christian religion and Christian faith and Christian belief perfectly unites the spiritual world, the unseen world, with the material world because Christ comes out of heaven and for 33 years he inhabits a physical, material body. There is no other belief system on the planet where this has ever taken place. Now, we're going to see, as we'll walk through this, as we go through the book of Luke together, what's interesting is there's all these spiritual attributes about God, like he's sovereign, he's holy, he's just, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, right? Well, the interesting thing is all those attributes, Christ actually lives out perfectly, proving that he has not only transcended, he has come across and he has brought, he has brought the spiritual world into the physical world. Is anybody kind of going, whoa? Okay, whoa. All right, okay. So, now this is what he says. Um, he says, uh, where are we? Verse, blah, 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 um, I forgot where we were. Oh, he made his dwelling among us. What, what verse is that? Uh, oh, that was John, John 1.14. Okay, John 1.14. He says, he became, the word, the word is the transcendent, right? Spiritual, right? Pre-creation existence of God without any material world. That's the word. The word became flesh. And this is an interesting, he made his dwelling, dwelling. He made his dwelling among us. Guess what the, the Greek word for dwelling is? It's tabernacle. <laughs> you know, like when they were in the desert, what did they build? A tabernacle. And a tabernacle was a mobile temple. It was like a tent, right? Because for 40 years, they went camping together in the desert. And whenever they packed up to leave, they took the tabernacle, which was a tent. It was a mobile temple. You ever put something together from Ikea? <laughs> Ikea? Ikea? <laughs> well, my daughter's Kia. So yeah, Ikea. Is that how you pronounce it? Ikea? Have you ever put something together with Ikea, right? Okay. Well, th have you ever read Leviticus like you were reading the instruction manual for Ikea? It's exactly that. If you read the book of Leviticus, it says this is how you build a tabernacle. You put it all together, and when you break it down, it even has a way to carry it. So that, you know, the poles that were used to hold up the tent? Now they become the poles that go in between the links so you can pick up the, the ark and walk with it without having to touch it. Pretty cool. Pretty ingenious, right? But what it says is God tabernacled. He camped with us, okay? Now, this is important. <laughs> Because Jesus basically came down and camped with us for 33 years. Now, before we go on to the next thing, I want to, I want to share something with you. Remember that movie that Rick had us watch on Sunday night? Boy, there's some F-bombs in that movie. <laughs> Just a few. I was kind of like, uh, are we supposed to be showing this movie? Is this, a, is this a Christian college? What's going on here? I was kind of a little bit blown away. But anyways, uh, what's his name? Marky Mark. Mark. Um, Okay, Mark Wahlberg says an interesting line in that movie that I thought fits my little diagram here really perfectly. He says, we aren't humans having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And I think he's really onto something right there because when you read through the Bible and you begin to understand it, one of the, th one of the things you'll realize 
is, according to the Bible, the spiritual world is actually more real, <laughs> more solid, and more long-lasting and eternal than the physical world. The physical world is temporary, and it's weak, and it's short-lived. Does that make sense? The Bible speaks about the spiritual world as the actual world, and this world is sort of like, well, it actually calls it a shadow. Now, when you have a shadow of something, what's real? The shadow or the thing? thing. The thing, right? Scripture teaches us this is like shadow. Okay, are you with me? Okay, so now uh, what's the song, Shepherds, Why This Jubilee, verses 8 through 10? And there were shepherds, okay, living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were? Terrified. <laughs> what's the first thing an angel always says? Verse 10, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Okay, I, I found this picture just about 20 minutes ago. This is kind of dumb. I just thought it was kind of funny. Anyways, okay, shepherds. Shepherds. Did you know this? Shepherds were like the lowest class of people at the time of Jesus. They were like the, you know, I don't even know, crop, what would, what would be the lowest class that we, had, we know of? Crop workers or something like that, you know? Garbage truck guy. Yeah, even those guys make better, better living. My gran my gra yeah, they actually get paid pretty good. My, uh, my grandfather picked crops uh, till he was 18 years old, living in a tent. He never actually had his first home until he was 18 years old with an actual roof, four walls, and running water. Isn't that crazy to think about? My grandfather was like, I, I found that out later on. I'm like, what? Anyways, but those are like the poorest of the poor. Now, God reveals himself to these guys. Like, this is a whole different thing than what's going on at the level of Caesar and Quinarius or whatever his name is, yeah. This is a whole different thing. Who else in the Bible was a shepherd? David. David. Oh, you're seeing some connection there, some Bible connection there. Uh, and, and many scholars reckon Jesus would spend part of his childhood also working as a shepherd. So these angels show up, and I just read this in a commentary the other day, and I was kind of struck by it. But apparently, this is the first time in Scripture that the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God, appears anywhere outside of the temple, okay? Because the glory of God is there. It's going to appear again when Jesus goes up the Mount of Transfiguration. They're going to see he's going to reveal his glory. But um, think about how the shepherds would have tripped on all of this. Like, talk about, like, m a mind blower. You're out in the middle of a field, and all of a sudden the heavens part, and, oh, right, you know? It's kind of kind of cray-cray. So let's look and see what happens. Oh, by the way, notice that they also said this. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Interesting. Now, we kind of take it for granted. Oh, Jesus loves everybody. You know, what's the song? Um, He's got the whole world in it, right? We, right? We all, we all kind of get this like, oh yeah, Jesus loves the whole world. But you understand for the Jews, what a new radical concept that was for them? These guys have spent the last 2,000 years being told by God, don't intermingle with other people. Separate yourselves from other people because you are, God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And it's just us, Right? This is the first little inkling we get in the book of Luke that Jesus is going to be Messiah for everybody. It's the first little clue of all this stuff that's going to happen later on. Okay, who remembers um, who watched um, A Charlie Brown Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> you remember at the end when Charlie Brown's all super bummed out, Christmas is ruined, and then Linus goes, I know the true meaning of Christmas, right? And he goes, lights, please. Right? <laughs> right? Clink, and then the spotlight goes on him, and this is the line he reads right here. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Let's just stop right there. Okay, here's the good news from Linus. It's not from Linus. It's from the angel, okay? This is the good news according to the angel in heaven. Look at the words he just used. A couple small but maybe important ones to pay attention to. He will be a savior. He is the Christ or the Messiah. He is Lord. These are all huge words, okay? 
So he's Savior of all, Messiah of all, and Lord of all, according to what they just said. And oh, by the way, he can be found in a little um, stall for animals in Bethlehem. Hmm, that's interesting. And then check out what happened. Verse 13, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared. There they are. Oh, right? The shepherd, um, uh, with the angels praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the she- by the way, can we just picture that for a moment? <laughs> Imagine you're like, these poor, most of, probably a lot of them were kids, too, because kids, you know, they got the, the brunt end of the stick, you know. Imagine they're just out there hanging out. It's all dark, quiet. And then all of a sudden, oh, you know, glory to God in the highest, go to Bethlehem, da-da-da. And then all of a sudden, vroom, vroom, it's over. Like, did you just think about, like, how radical that was for a second? And so what do they do? They're like, um, when the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherd said, oh, we should go to Bethlehem. <laughs> you think? And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about, okay? Uh, By the way, just my notes here, uh, a company of the heavenly host, it's a military definition. And this little episode right here with the angels crying out glory is called the Gloria, yeah? And um, he's going to bring peace to men on whom his favor rests. Okay, so uh, verse 15 Oh, so they, oh, it says, verse, oh, yeah. So they heard, let's jump, jump up in 16 to 18. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word. But I looked up that today earlier to see if it said gospel, and it didn't. It quite literally meant, like, spread around the, good, the news, the word. Spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So, in my opinion, these are like the very first evangelists. Like, what do they do? They, they, they run off to go tell everybody. But I got an um, interesting thought here for you. Before they took off, what information do you think that they shared with Mary and Joseph? I'm going to guess... Everything that they saw and everything that they heard while they were out in the field, which would be, (laughs) do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. So you think they might might have told that to Joseph and Mary? Okay, I'm guessing they did, because here's why. Let's read verse 19. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Okay, so this idea that Mary treasured, most of you probably know that line already from the Christmas story. Treasured, it means pondered, right? It means actually at the root word, um, let me get off this so you don't have to look at that anymore. The word treasured or pondered, it actually means this, to bring together in the mind, okay? Doesn't that make sense? So you got, you know, have you ever had one of those things, we ever say something like, I feel kind of scatterbrained today, right? And to bring things together into your mind is sort of to take all this information and kind of try to hold it into one. It literally means in the Greek, unify scattered bits, (laughs) Treasured sounds much better for a Christmas card, doesn't it? And Mary treasured. It literally means to unify scattered bits. So here's what I picture right now. She's looking at her newborn baby, this little, you know, 12-hour-old infant, right? Maybe breastfeeding or whatever, right? She's trying to put together all that she's heard to this point. Now, Let's rewind a little bit. Remember when we were talking about um, when she first went to go visit um, Uncle Zeke and Aunt Liz, and um, Liz was already six months pregnant, right? And uh, Mary had just heard the story, and I said, what do you think they talked about? Okay, so what I did one time, I went back and I gathered, we're only in chapter 2, verse 20, and what I did was I gathered everything that has been talked about about the baby Jesus who's coming to this point. 
with the idea that they have discussed every one of these things, and every one of these things is all the things that Mary has heard, and now she's trying to put them all together. Do you want to hear what it is? Okay. Okay, one person does. Everybody else, <laughs> whatever. Okay, here's all the things. This baby is going to be Savior, Messiah, the bringer of peace, the Lord. He will be salvation. He will bring forgiveness of sins. He will be light shining in a darkness. He will be the Son of the Most High. On the throne of David reigning over the whole entire house of Israel, he will have a kingdom without end, and he will fulfill all the promises of Abraham. That's a few things. I counted. That's 12. Nice biblical number, yeah? Imagine Mary tried to put all that together, and she's holding it in her arms. The reason why I'm kind of over-dramatizing this for you <laughs> is what I want you to get a grasp of is what happens when the transcendent, sovereign, creator God of the universe, who is spirit, comes to earth. This is what we get. A baby who is all these things. And you've got probably a 14-year-old girl holding all that in her arms. Pretty nuts, yeah? So the shepherds go back to work. Um, no commentator said anything about this, but it kind of made me wonder, like, if you're a shepherd, how do you just kind of go back to being a shepherd after seeing that? Do you think your life might change? I mean, I mean, think about that. Do you think their lives might have changed a little bit? It would have maybe caused them to maybe have some more discussions out in the field? Now, imagine what's going to happen over the next 33 years in their life. Like, let's at least imagine they're very young. Some of those young shepherds are going to live through the entire lifetime of Christ, and they will be around when he's arrested, crucified, and resurrected. When the word comes, as it will, because it's a small area, and everybody knows what's going on, especially if you've been there, Bethlehem's like about, like, you can, almost, you can see Jerusalem from Bethlehem. It's like right across the valley. It's all right there, right? When they hear about the resurrection, what, you think they're going to believe it? <laughs> you, you bet. You bet. So now let me finish with this last thought, and then we can open it up for discussion. I got a couple discussion things here if you're interested to wind it all the way back. Remember what I told you what happened to me the first day I ever like encountered Christ? What were my first words? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. We have a visitor here. He's going to be like, what are you teaching these guys? I said, oh, crap. And the reason why is this. Because if the sovereign creator of the universe, God, with a capital G, God, came to earth, inhabited a physical body, walked around, and he talked, and he taught, and he did stuff. To me, it changes everything. And that's why I knew, I just knew it was going to change my life. And I didn't want that. <laughs> this is going to really monkey with my life. Point is, I bring it all down to you guys right now, is this. If this is real, it changes everything. And it should change your life. And this should inform everything you do in your life how you live your life, the decisions you make about your life, who you choose to marry, how you choose to raise your kids, what field you go into, how you spend your time, how you spend your money, all comes down to this idea. What we call in one quick two-word term is, have you heard this? God incarnate. By the way, you know what incarnate means? It means in the flesh. You know how you can remember? Have you ever had carne asada? <laughs> right? What does that mean? It means meat. It means marinated meat. Have you ever had chili con carne? That's chili with meat. God in carne is God becoming meat. <laughs> Are you with me? Okay. So I know, like, you, you don't really go around saying God became meat. You'd probably freak out some people. But that's literally what the term means. Transcendent spiritual God became flesh, became human, became meat. All right, does anybody have any questions or comments? We've only got a few minutes. Yes, Nick. So is there any particular reason why God sent angels to collect and tell the shepherds? I mean, Good question. Kind of like 
It does seem really random. I don't even know that I can answer that. Random, random. Let's see. Okay, if we try to make connections, which I always do, which is to try to play everything that happens in the New Testament to see if there was an Old Testament... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? What? Prophecy. Yeah, prophecy is what I'm looking for. Or precedent, too. Precedent or prophecy. Only thing I can think of is David was a shepherd, you know, and he will be born in the line of David. I'm kind of grasping at straws here, this and that. Um, it's interesting to me... Um, I'll give you another example. Some more stuff's coming in my head right now as I talk. Um, God chooses to reveal his glory, quite honestly, to the lowest of the low. Okay? Now, if you want to see it... who I get chicken skin. Here's what's coming. If you want to see where that precedent leads to, who was the first people, the first people who were to know that Christ had risen from the dead? Mary, Mary and... I think Mary and Martha, or Mary, it was two girls, two women, right? Two Marys. I think it was two Marys, yeah? Okay, women. I just wanted to point this out to you. Did you know that at the time of Christ, a woman's word was not to be believed? Did you know women at the time of Christ were not allowed to testify in court? Because the word of a woman wasn't considered, considered trustworthy or truthful. Who does God decide to give the news of the most important news in the history of the universe to women. God always does the unexpected. I mean, I'll give you another example. Who in the Bible does God choose mouthpiece? He says, you will be my mouthpiece. Moses. Does anybody know anything interesting about Moses? He has a speech impediment or a stutter. Look at how God always does the unexpected. He always takes the least likely. So Nick, that's a long answer to your question, but maybe God said, I'm going to show the least likely, the ones that nobody will pay any attention to because nobody gives a rip about any shepherd. Anyways, I thought that was cool. But they also, one of the things they also do, Nick, as well, is they come running in because who else is going to be awake at 2 a.m., right? Right? Are you, are you with me? Who else is awake at 2 a.m.? But shepherds, there. there's another reason. See, we start thinking about this stuff. Stuff just starts coming to us, yeah? And they're going to come, and they're bringing the word of a Savior who is the Christ. They're bringing that news to Mary. So Mary, now she's getting more information. She gets more information and more confirmation from the shepherds. Imagine Mary. She's got a little baby. She just gave birth. Kind of she's in shock and awe, right? And these dudes come running in. We just saw the most amazing thing. We just saw the freaking heavens open up. And this voice came out of heaven, and an angel told us, your little baby is going to be the savior of the world, right? What do you think Mary's thinking at this point? She's probably believing this, wouldn't you think? Yeah, she's probably about, okay, I've seen, I've got enough evidence. So there was more evidence for you. Good question, though, Nick. Anybody else? Gosh, I've just talked you all into just total oblivion, like, oh, don't talk anymore. I think that's it. Uh, I might have, let's see, a couple applications. I already kind of went over about the whole, like, what you believe about that is, um, I already told you how that smashes the border, transcendent God comes into creation, kind of told you all about that. One of the, this is, you might find this interesting as a historical thing. Um, the very, you know what a heresy is? A heresy is like a, a teaching that goes against the Bible or against the church. The very first heresy in history was called Gnosticism, right? And it happened within just a few years of Christ. What the heresy was, was they believed that there was two worlds, the material world and the spiritual world. And what they taught was that the spirit world is good and the material world is bad. The reason why the church said this was a heresy is because we don't believe that. We believe that we live in a fallen creation. But materialism alone isn't bad. It's just fallen. And it's going to be redeemed. Why is that important? <laughs> because from what we understand from Scripture, we will inhabit physical, material bodies in heaven. We're not just going to be like, spirits, right? We're actually going to live in a physical creation, and we're going to possess physical bodies. And Christ makes it all possible because he inherits it. So 
they, they believe that there's no way Christ, they believe Christ was never uh, physical or material. That they believe that Christ was a ghost because he couldn't be material. You understand? And so that's why it's a heresy. We have to believe that Christ inhabited a physical, material human body and yet was without sin. Does that make sense? He was the only unfallen part of creation. Okay, that's it. I think we're... Uh, it's time to start the weekend, don't you guys think? What's that? You guys got another class? Oh, you have cleaning. So, okay. So if you're going to be cleaning right now, think about this. Oh, tomorrow morning. Oh. Saturday's cleaning day. Oh, joy. Oh, you have a session tomorrow night? And I can help clean? And then I could show you how the spiritual world helps me work in the physical world, right? Yeah. I'm having a material humanistic experience right now. But in my head, I'm in heaven. Yeah, good luck with that. All right, you guys. Well, have a great weekend. And, um, yeah, we'll see you. I don't think I'll see you until Wednesday. Yeah, you guys are welcome.